Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of the Independent Dealer Podcast. This week, we've got a special guest, a fellow dealer, Dan Grosvenor. Did I get that right, Dan? That's right. <laughs> all, right all right, Jeff, what, uh, what all we got this week? The next 30, 45 minutes are awesome, guys. I'm super passionate about this stuff. Dan is going to tell us about himself, and he's going to go over the EOS, the Entrepreneur Operating System. That's correct. Which is a cool, cool system by Gino Wickman that he put together. Dan's a subscriber of it. And he's going to show us how the whole vision and the whole process of this fits together to just get control of your dealership. Don't let the business own you, right? Own the business. Yes. I mean, I'm yep. going to go back and listen to this one uh, quite <laughs> a few times. And I guarantee you, uh, I'm downloading the books and this yep. because yeah, you have a couple crazy days and you have some nuts going on with COVID and everything's all over the place. And you're like, what am I doing here? It's like a chicken. I'm just a firefighter, right? Dan's going to show us how to not be a firefighter. All right. I'm going to do, try, I'm going to do my best. All right, here we go. You are listening to the independent dealer podcast with hosts, Luke Godwin and Jeff Watson. Thank you so much for tuning in. Let's do this. So uh, my name is Dan Grosvenor. Uh, we're in the St. Louis market. Um, we've been in business for about 22 years. Um, started with my, uh, my, my brother at that time. We had a little bit of a falling out. We had two locations at that time and we, we, we branched off. Um, and we're brothers again after all these years. So that was good. So don't, don't go into business with family <laughs> if you can avoid it. Um, yeah. the, um, we started out as strictly a buy here, pay here uh, uh, lot at the time. And it was back in the day when you could buy a car for $500, get $500 down, sell it for $19.95. Yep, I was one of those guys that, that was the urban legend. Um, we built that portfolio up to about 500 accounts um, with, with, uh, with those $2,000 cars, and man, it was miserable. Mm. Um, you'd sell 10 cars <laughs> on a Saturday and have, have, uh, have six ticked off people on, on Monday. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and that was, that was obviously a whole lifetime ago. Um, and then we, we, we branched off into, into credit acceptance and then more into indirect financing across the board. Um, right now, I, I still have a buy here, pay here portfolio. Um, you know, last year was about 15% of our business um, each month. So it's a, it's a small portfolio, portfolio um, as we sit here today, but as the tides change, it will become more of the portfolio depending mm -hmm. on what the market does. We kind of towed that line. Um, last year we averaged about hundred cars a month. Um, you know, right here during the, the COVID time we're, we're hit a little harder, even though COVID hasn't hit us as much. Um, it's, it's hit the business a little bit more here than it has in other parts of the country, um, which is really strange that it's, that that's the case. Um, so, so we're, we're not doing quite as many as we were, um, you know, from March till, till today, but last year we sold about hundred cars a month. Yeah. Great. That's and tell me the makeup of that. Is that 15% uh, still buy here, pay here you hold and the rest go to CAC and other subprimes? Yeah. So recently it's been um, more like 20 to 25% of the business has been buy here, pay here. Okay. Um, and, and, and credit acceptance is a piece of what we do. Um, we're big with Cap One and, and, and uh, you know, Santander and, and all the, the, the okay. usual suspects. Okay. And Daniel, wow. what's, the, uh, what's the average ACV of the car you sell? Uh, my average ACV, it's up a little bit right at the moment, but historically we are we are around that thirteen thousand um, dollar ACV. Whew. So even our credit acceptance deals are are a higher ACV than typical. Yeah. Uh, well, they have to be because if I don't, if I allow a low ACV in credit acceptance, what does it do? It sucks out my 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 prime buy here pay here um, customer. So I, I have them capped on the on the the. If we're not getting funded ten thousand dollars it goes into credit except you know it, it goes into my portfolio not in in credit acceptance okay mm -hmm. we have a full service department um, about 40 employees that was my next question dan for you 40 employees makes up how many sales you know just give us a real quick overview of front staff and back staff and do you have you know how many helpers i mean that's a that's an organization man i mean you're you guys selling 100 cars yep. um with 40 people I, I can't even fathom keeping that straight yeah. So it's, it, well, it's, it's layers of management. Um, so you have to have the right people. You know, and, and I've for years um, kind of, you know, how do these big companies, how, how do these companies manage to have all these, you know, hundreds of locations and all these, these, you know, it just doesn't make sense. Well, 
I kind of made that same statement that uh, uh, you did, Jeff, is, is that how the hell do you manage, you know, 50, 100 employees? Well, it's, it's about having people um, and having management in, be, in between. Um, so we, we have um, uh, with, uh, three sales managers, so usually about a dozen um, salespeople, um, you know, half a dozen technicians, service manager, assistant service manager, service writer, BDC department. So, Dan, can I, uh, a quick question on the layers of management, because this is very interesting to me. Um, I have, on any given time, 17 to 19 employees. At what point do you have to start installing levels of management? How many employees do you think you get at that? Because right now it seems like everybody's still reporting to me, and I'm not sure that's the right way to go there. Yeah, so here's the thing. So uh, if, if you were like me, and still to a degree, it's always there, is I had to have my hands in everything. Right. I, I, you know, all the big decisions I had to have. And what really did it for me is we, we, we bought the facility that we're in right now. We were renting for, for years and years, bought the facility we're in right now about seven years ago. And it was a, um, a very laboring. It was, I was buying it out of foreclosure. It was a time when uh, the government shut down. I mean, I had just a lot of work to do. So I had to let go of the reins. I had to let go of the vine. I had to, I had to turn it over to the management staff I had there at the time who, who are still with me today. Um, and you know what I f discovered is they do it better than me. They do certain things better than me. Um, so, you know, it's about, I guess, figuring out what the data points are that you need to watch the key performance indicators that you need to keep an eye on and, and, and figure out what the real critical conversations are and the real critical things you need to watch and have them manage the day to day. Mm. That's it's easier so said than done. It's yeah. easier said than done. It's when you become the difference between what a, an operator and an owner, you know, and I'm or, still self-employed. Um, yeah. You know, don't you own a job, you don't own a business, but you're getting better at owning a system. Yeah. And a business instead of you're the guy that makes all the decisions on whether the engine goes in or doesn't go in. And you're the guy that makes right. the decision on whether we're going to do tires for that customer or whether we're not, right. you know, yeah, you've got to step away from those. Right. And that's a hard I thing to even, do is us. Don't even want to have those conversations and they know that <laughs> and they do a better job than I do. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's hard as you rise up and say, okay, I, I, I am the best at uh, closing a deal or I am the best mm -hmm. at making sure the paperwork's accurate, but it is not the best use of my time. Right. 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 I yeah. can do it. I'm capable and more capable right. than maybe anyone is in some things. Right. Maybe not well, others, and, but, and so, but I've so got to let it go in order to not be the bottleneck. And if you're out there, if you're out there selling cars, well then basically essentially you, you're, you're, you're a salesman. <laughs> income as a sales, as a salesperson. Right. Yeah. So what's a salesperson make? Well, that's, if you're out there sweeping the lot, well, you're, 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 Time is being utilized at twelve dollars an hour. I mean, that's yeah, yeah. And, I, and I've gotten, I, I get away from all that. I, I, I hate to sell cars, so I finally got away. You know, years ago, got away from that. But you know, it seems like that's the hard thing for for any entrepreneur to do is to start to remove themselves away because we're the ones that that built the company and we're the ones that know how to do every job. Um, and I guess what I'm leading into is is some of of what you were going to talk about today was you know, how, how actually do you do that? What's the, what's the best philosophy to get, to get out of your day-to-day -day operations and into to being a business? Yeah. So it's your baby, right? I mean, so how do you just walk away from your baby? But you know, at some point the, the baby has to grow up. Um, yeah. So, you know, I wanted to um, kind of go over something that's really helped us grow. Um, and it's, it's called the, uh, the EOS process. And, and what EOS stands for is, is entrepreneurial operating system. Um, and I probably should have checked with you ahead of time, see if we can even share a screen. I know a lot of people listen to the podcast, but you also do the, the YouTube version as yeah. well. Yeah, um, you can share it somehow. Hey, just to interrupt the podcast real quick, Luke, our friends over at Dealer Re, we're, we're, I mean, I think we're doing some good for them here at the podcast. I Dealers are jumping it. on board. They see the importance of having their own reinsurance company. If you don't have your reinsurance company, I cannot say this enough. Do it. Stop today, call Taylor Bird, get him on the phone, call Tim. I'm not sure if Tim's in the office every day, but you call them, get them on the phone and get started creating wealth and not just getting by in the car business. Yes, 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 yes. Tax deferred monies you're going to put in your left pocket. You're going to save it for a rainy day. Um, it, it really makes me think that uh, it's, you know, all dealers have got to put it in. 
They've got to put yeah, it in you, their business. You've got to start now. If you're giving somebody else warranty money, you're losing money. If you're not doing this, you're losing money. I mean, it's yeah. that simple. And we're going to get the guys on soon to talk more in depth. I really want some more training on my CPI product. I'm not getting the penetration I need to. We'll get into some more depth on that soon. So stay tuned. Sounds good. All right. Okay. So, so if you're joining us on YouTube, you're going to see a video here that Dan is going to pull up. That's going to explain this, the EOS system. And, and I know a little bit, only probably what I've Googled 30 minutes ago when I knew this was going to happen. Same with Luke, but get online and look at it if you're listening. Um, and if so you're on you our YouTube this? channel, you'll see it. Yeah. Okay. I think everyone can see your, your, okay, your, uh, good. So, you know, and I'll try to explain the best I can too, but, but the visual does kind of help. So, so what it boils down to is first of all, the EOS entrepreneurial operating system, it is, it's based on a book by Gino Wickman. And what Gino Wickman has done is he's pretty much taken a lot of the things that a, on a lot of other books that a lot of other people have written and kind of made it into kind of a, a, of, a of an actionable process. And so, you know, you have Dave Anderson on, right? Everybody loves Dave Anderson. We, we mm -hmm. subscribe to his training. I mean, we, we physically send managers. We, I personally go to his, 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 his onsite trainings mm -hmm. or offsite trainings. Um, and he talks about culture and, and, and vision and, and, and all these things. Clarity. How, how do you, clarity, absolutely. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Um, and so the, the, you know, a lot of the, the, the training that we listen to, it, it's, it's the, on what you should do, but not as much of the how. Mm -hmm. And so what this program kind of does is it kind of breaks down the how, um, you know, so for instance, you know, the first point is, is the vision component of, of what you need to do. So it needs to be crystal clear, like Jeff just said. So, you know, what is your, what are your values, right? Every organization has values. It's just, are they the ones you really want them to be and who's dictating these values? Um, so deciding exactly what is, what is it that your company stands for? Critical step one. Um, I thought it was a bunch of kumbaya crap that Boeing put on their <laughs> investor reports. Um, you know, these are our values. When in reality, um, it is how we hire and fire and decide what we're going to do next. <laughs> um, another piece of it is, you know, of the vision is to what is your core purpose? What is your what is your niche? What is it that you do? And so we had to kind of decide, um, you know, we were talking about before we got on here, you know, uh, I'm part of the rich dealer group and a big part of the message is a subprime message. And so I would always struggle as, as some of my other dealer friends would of, man, you, you have this loud subprime message, Well, you're really going to turn off a lot of the prime buyers. Well, with going through this process, I discovered, I don't care. They're not my buyer. Mm. Um, so what is my, you know, now we can handle, we have the finance companies and we have the cars and we have all the things we can sell a car to a fine, to a sub, to a prime buyer. But if I, if they're turned off by my message, they're not who I'm talking to anyway. Mm. Um, my service department, you know, can't be everything to everybody can't be all things to all people. And that's what so many folks try that's to right. do, you know, and, and you get chased off by shiny stuff like, um, right. you know, you know, do I want to start selling four wheelers on the lot? Well, could I do that? Yeah. But it takes away from the focus of what it is yep. that we're here to do, which is to, 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 to help folks with credit challenges, um, get into nicer, newer cars, uh, in the St. Louis market. I'm not trying to sell cars outside the market. This is just, we're here. This is what we're, we're what we're focused on. Same with my service department. Um, we don't want to do big jobs. Um, we don't want to, um, do service work outside of our existing customer base. I don't really have the capacity and it takes away the focus. I want to be mm -hmm. able to service all of my customers we sold cars to and their households. That will keep my service department filled along with my reconditioning. I get to make money on them and I keep them my customer forever. So that's what we decided our focus is, right? Mm -hmm. So step one is to figure out what your vision, what your, what your values are, and then you, and then beyond that, you have to make sure the entire organization knows that's exactly who you are, and that's the direction you want to go. Everyone's rowing in the same, in the same direction. Mm -hmm. They know what that direction is. Um, you know, and then the next step to the right, well, actually, I like to go to the left first. So, so the people component, we talked a little bit about that. Um, getting the right people, right? So we hire and fire based on our values. Um, and 
the EOS model uses, uses what's called a people analyzer. And we made a couple of bad hires over the past few months. Um, we mm -hmm. hired a BDC manager and we hired a, a service manager. Historically, we would make a bad hire. We have a bad, uh, you know, team member just wasn't producing or just wasn't the right fit. We would leave that. We would keep that person for sometimes a year. Right. And no, we've all done it. Know that, you know, this person just isn't right, but we just hang on to him just because he's always been here or, you know, oh, he's going through yeah. a rough patch, whatever. Yep. So yep. what this does is this gives you the ability to rank people. Do they follow the core values? You go one by one. Do they follow this value? Yes or no. Do they follow this value? Yes or no. And so on and so forth. And you figure out what your threshold is as to how often they break those values because no one's <laughs> perfect. Right. Yeah. And then what's, so that's, are they the right person? Mm -hmm. and then are they on the right seat on the bus? Do they get it? Do they want it? And do they have the capacity to do it? Mm -hmm. So they call it GWC for short, right? So do mm -hmm. they get it? Is it in their DNA? Do they, do, they, do they have what it takes to even be able to sell cars for 12 hours a day in the heat, cold, you know, the rejection, that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. um, do they want it? I mean, do they actually show up and actually want to do this job? And then do they have the capacity to do it? I mean, can they actually, are they built to even do this to begin with? So mm -hmm. we managed to, I say managed, it's, it's, it's a failure, but the fact that we identified within, within a matter of four weeks, uh, in particular the service manager, he just wasn't right for this job, mm -hmm. uh, where historically we would have just drug on and try to make something work. Um, so I'm going to flip back over here, over, over to the right, to the vision component, or I'm sorry, over past the vision component, which is the data. Um, so we talked a little bit about, you know, if you take a step back and so if you were on a, if you were on a, a, a tropical island, right, mm -hmm. you're sitting there, you're drinking your Mai Tai and you're on the beach, you know, what are the data points? What are the key performance indicators? What would you have to know about your business? You know, maybe 10, 15 things. Um, it would tell you at a snapshot what the health of your business is. Um, that's where these go. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, some of the things that we, that we talk about is, you know, what we're trending for the month as far as units, what we're trending for the month as far as gross. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how many cars do we get reconditioned last, last week? And it's looked at weekly, monthly, or quarterly, depending on the metric. Most of these things are weekly. Um, and then what also helped us move the service manager in particular along is the fact that we, 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 we look at 13 weeks across the board. And if the numbers aren't where they need to be and you don't see them trending in the right way, well, you can make decisions very quickly, very without any emotion, without any, the data is the data, right? So that's another important piece of it. Um, next piece is, the can I stop you for one second? What, yeah, sure. You just said 13 weeks. Um, is that arbitrary or is that, I mean, how, how do no. you know what, well, how I came up with great, great question. So how we came up with, with 13 weeks is we use a software to help kind of implement, to help kind of organize this. It's called 90.io and it is a EOS based software. There's a couple of them out there. We use 90. Um, and 13 weeks is just the data, the data stream that it shows. Um, okay. uh, there's, there's, I'm sure there's some science behind it. Um, I don't know what it is if there is. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess that's enough time to tell you, I guess uh, short enough, I guess, to, to, to do something about it, but far enough away to actually maybe see trends is probably the okay. reason behind mm -hmm. it. And, and, so, and so you can hire a fire within those 13 weeks is what is, is what that, factor is or that data is telling you? Well, you know, you have a problem because it's, because it's not even necessarily about hiring and firing. We used it for that. We, you know, the GWC and the data wasn't our guy and we knew it. Gotcha. We knew it very, very rapidly. Uh, in fact, he probably wouldn't have made it that long, but I, I took a few days off and went to the lake and, <laughs> and you know, um, so it kind of got put on the back burner. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, you know, the next piece is, uh, is processes. And this is something that we're terrible at and most entrepreneurs are. It's the, it's the, the, your, your, um, your core processes should be written down and mm. followed by everybody. Oh. So just like the vision, it's, it's, it's communicated with everyone. It's clear. Same with your processes. You know, there's, there's, there's a, a process for how you greet a customer, how you bring the customer in the office. I mean, there's, there's a certain way that each of you in your dealership would like for it to be done. 
Um, and unless it's really written down and, and, you know, if you, unless you have, a, if you have an organization of any size, which you talk about, how do you get from 17 employees, which I don't want to necessarily say the goal is to get to 50 employees, no. <laughs> um, but, um, but how do you manage that? If, if, if 50 employees, if your growth requires 50 employees, how do you do that? Well, you have to document your core processes. Mm -hmm. Um, though, you know, the, the, the name of my dealership is five star auto plaza. So it's the five star way. That's just the way we do it here. And it's black and white. Um, hmm. the, the, over here to the left, it's the issues, right? So this, this program has a sp very specific way of taking emotion out of things and having meetings done in a certain way. You've all been in meetings that just are meetings just for meeting sake, right? That yeah. just, we're just going to meet for the sake of getting together and just running down rabbit holes and having conversations about this, that, or the other. You start talking about sales numbers. Next thing you know, you're, you're complaining because the porters didn't get the cars clean enough. Um, <laughs> you know, and you never really solved anything. So there is a very specific track in which you, you follow the, the um, it's called a meeting pulse um, where you go down your, you know, are you following the vision? What are the data points? You don't discuss it. If there's a problem with the data at that point, a data point, you move it on to your issues list. And this is really hard to explain just audio wise, but the idea behind it is you take your top issues, you as your, as your management team discuss them and they're solved forever. You never talk about them again. You start talking about what the porters are doing. The reason why we're not selling many cars is, but you know, because, 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 well, they're not clean enough. And then, well, I remember a time back in, you know, 1994 when I had a dirty car and, and Tauruses are always dirty. I've noticed. And then you're talking about how we can't sell Tauruses and quit buying mm -hmm. Tauruses. Well, so it's a very specific track on, on keeping the meetings. Um, and we, on pace. yeah, you know, we had discussed this a couple of weeks ago, Jeff, how you need to have, you know, meetings. Need, if you're going to do sales training, it needs to be sales training. If you're going to do service meeting, it needs to be service. And if you're going to do uh, housekeeping meetings, it should be housekeeping. And, and, and I really, I love what you're talking about here, Dan. It, it makes so much sense to me. Yep. I listened to that. That was actually a very good, uh, very good uh, uh, spot you guys did. Thank you. Um, and then kind of the final part there, it, it goes along with the meetings, you know, there's the traction component. And what that is, is, is what are the company's rocks? And I don't know if you guys have read seven habits of highly effective people. Um, but a, a big, uh, by Stephen Covey, but a, a big portion of this is based on a lot of Stephen Covey's seven habits mm -hmm. and what the rocks are is, um, you know, Stephen Covey, you know, years ago did a, did an example. He took a glass cylinder and he had a, he had some large rocks. He had some gravel, he had some sand, he had some water and, and he, he brought some up on stage and said, okay, let's, you know, I want you to put all this in the glass cylinder. So people would pour the water and they'd pour the sand and they put the gravel in. Well, the rocks would never fit. Well, the, 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 the long and short of it is if you put the big rocks in first, then you, which is but the idea behind it, the metaphor behind it is your, your, you know, the, the important stuff in your life, the important stuff mm -hmm. in your business, whatever the case may be. Then you put the gravel in there, right? That's, that's the, the important, but not as, as big. Uh, then the sand, then the water, and it all fits in that cylinder. So the idea behind the rocks are what are the most important things for your business to get done for the next quarter? Mm -hmm. um, you usually have one, no more than two of the, the big things that you just have to tackle. Um, and, and, you know, you, and you, you tackle that and you, every quarter you have another set of rocks. Every quarter you have another set of rocks because what we have a habit of doing is trying to slay every dragon every day. Um, and what winds up happening? Nothing gets solved. Nothing gets fixed, yeah. you know? How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Yeah. My problem is I get so sick of moving large rocks that sometimes I just want to play in the sand for a while. And then, <laughs> and then I get stuck just playing in the sand and I get all muddy and I realize no one's moved any rocks around. So, they're hard. But that's, but that's what all entrepreneurs get, get involved in sometimes. And I think what, and what's so important with what Dan's talking about is this is how you get to the next level, right, Dan? Well, and what I'll also say, Jeff, is that the rocks that you talk about, mm -hmm. are they really rocks? Are they really big? Are they, are they really the big things? You know, yeah. sometimes they appear to be. 
Oh, for um, sure. And that's part of this issue is, you know, IDS, identify, discuss, and solve. And what winds up happening is, is, is an issue that you think is an issue that you think is the problem. Yeah. As you and, your, and your, your management team start talking it out, what you discover is that maybe what you thought was the problem was actually a byproduct of a different problem in which it needs to be solved over yeah. here. So, so, you know, I find myself chasing after stuff that appear, you know, the urgent, but not important yeah. um, that appear to be big problems when in actuality, I, I you know, I, I need to be focusing on something that's not really acting on me, the important, not urgent. And that's where I'd plug the dealer community. Sometimes you don't have upper management, you don't have those people, or you're in your own paradigm of your dealership where you think that is the big problem. And then someone from the outside looks at it and says, no, 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 that's not the real problem. Your problem is over here, started back here. And, and that helps talking to other dealers in the your community. 20 group. Yep. And yeah. Yep. What I wanted to ask Dan was, so I think the process little wedge in this is one of the largest vision and process. I think those are huge. And we always talk about mm -hmm. process, document your process, document your process. So it's such a thorn in your side because it's such a hard thing. It's a moving target. Mm -hmm. You may have a process for 10 years and then all of a sudden you implement a new software or you have some new thing and now you've got to go back and restructure. Are there any tools that you're using is there a software within this that helps you actually document that? Or is this just a, a word document and some napkins? Yeah, that's a great question. And that is probably the worst. Ugh, the thing I hate the most. Yeah. Like you said, it's probably one of the most so crucial. It is. But, but so no, there is no other than, other than then maybe not getting too deep in the weeds. Cause I have that same, that same problem of man, I, it's gotta be perfect. Right. If, if I don't write it word for word, just perfect it's 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 everyone's gonna, gonna learn it wrong yeah it's gonna get this translated but let's go back to last week's episode for a second jeff and marshall talked about this and and what dan just described is we we do like to be perfect but i but to start with you just got to get something down mm -hmm. and you can add you can add to it as it goes and jeff we, we learned that you had it written down but you haven't given it to anybody no, right and covid's <laughs> gonna change it all right yeah all of a sudden what i've been doing forever all of a sudden changes but that's okay that, if it's written down, it's documented, you can edit it as you go. And yeah. I'm, sure Dan, I'm sure Dan's editing his every week, every two weeks, right? And it's, and luckily I have a manager that's really good at it. And I kind of oh, tell her, hey, this, this is what we want to get done. And yeah. she, you know, she's, so that's another piece too, something that, that's, that's another piece of this as well. What is it that, that, that nobody else, what is it one that you enjoy doing in your organization? Yeah. What do you enjoy doing? You know, Luke said, you, you know, you said you don't like selling cars. Well, you have no, then you shouldn't sell cars, right? You probably right, should anyway, right. but, but you should yeah. stay away from the sales floor. Mm -hmm. um, what else, you know, what do you, what do you love to do? What do you, what are you best in the organization at doing? Those are the things you should be doing. Everything else should be delegated. That's part of this process. Uh, that's, that's so powerful. And that's so important. And so many of us don't do that. Yeah. Um, and we don't, we don't trust that the people we hire, are better than us at doing certain things, right, Dan? And that is actually a quote from from the book: "Is let go of the vine." Is you just need to let go, and and you know what? Some of the things that you're doing really well today, maybe only get done about sixty percent mm -hmm. as well. But you know what? Yeah. That's that's that gives you the time to do the things that are going to drive the business further. Now, these things are easier said than done. I struggle with this every single day. Yeah. This, is, yeah. this is this is how it's supposed to work. That's not necessarily how I live my life every day. So don't. Yeah. Think that for a second, what, but uh, Dan. So I, I've started. I started trying to implement a software called Trainual that okay. came across one of my feeds, and it's that same thing. It's this process builder, Trainual, something or other. What are you, are you using? A software? Or are you using a Google Doc? Or are you using? Is she using a Word doc? This person yeah. that's updating your processes. What do you physically use? She's using just Word docs right now. Okay. Okay. Um, and that's they will go on a, a, a Google. It'll go into a Google Drive, but. It, um, but right now it's just, it's just word document, um, things that is, that is probably the, the part that we're the least advanced in at this yeah. point. I'm going to get these, I'm going to line up these people from Trainual for a, a podcast. It's really, that's really a good interesting idea. gig. So important. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good idea. You know, what we did is we just, we started writing our manuals, um, with the help of, of Freeman. Um, but we started writing ours just through a Google drive and, yeah. and you can print it out and hand it to everybody. And, you know, yep. you got to start somewhere, and that's the that's the main focus here. 
Dan, this is, this is awesome. What, how long have you been using this in your business and, and what shape, you know, how, how much have you grown since you started doing this, this process? So the, the, we've been doing this for about a year now we've self self implemented is what they call it. So, you know, they recommend that you, you, you get an EOS implementer, um, that are very, that are very, very expensive. Um, sure. We chose to get the manuals and the books and I think they even have my, you know, like they give you a whole, you know, this is actually what your implementer will actually yeah. bring in. Um, Jump back and to your a very screen, speci- Dan. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. So we you probably see didn't see it. So anyway, see there's, there's, there's a, there's a, a screen. You're not seeing my screen. I'm but not anyway. seeing you. Oh, <laughs> gotcha. Anyway. Um, there's, they, they have a whole system. Where would you start? I mean, you mentioned the book by Gino Whitman. Which one are you referencing? So the, it's Gino Wickman, W-I-C-K-M-A-N. Uh-huh. Um, and it's Traction. Okay. That's kind of his flagstone book, right? I think he's got five or six, but that was where yeah. you would say we should start. You should and start then, with Traction. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, and I was going to say also, um, if you decide to self-implement, implement, get a grip is what you and your entire management team, you need to read both of those um, mm-hmm. if this is a path you decide to take. Mm-hmm. Now, because an implementer will cost you about eh, anywhere from four to $5,000 a day. Um, cool. Yeah. I'm in the wrong business. Yeah, no question. Um, we just met with, uh, with an implementer for the first time um, this past week. Uh, we've kind of had some, some culture problems with, uh, with, with COVID. It's kind of affected some of our management and mm-hmm. we're not exactly as cohesive as we once were. Um, it's time for me to bring in a professional, um, yeah. that, kind of that third party. Um, so the end of next month, we're going to have our first meeting with an employee. But, but here's We've the thing. It pretty far. I mean, I, I don't know, Danny, if you know this offhand or would share, but what your monthly payroll has got to be, you know, two, three hundred thousand dollars <laughs> You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, bringing in an implementer or, you know, a, a coach or something, it's very relative. When you see, yeah. when you say three to $5,000 a day, it's like, well, I'm spending 300000 a month. So it's a drop yeah. in the bucket for me to make sure I'm not paying the wrong person. And have well, and so everyone, and, and so this isn't, this isn't my idea to, to start doing this, right? I, there's a lot of car dealers um, that are much bigger than me that I look up to um, that have implemented this process. And, and I also know people in, in other industries that have implemented this process as well that I look up to. Um, and every single one of them that have, that have, that have hired an implementer um, have, have said, yeah, I didn't want to do the money. That's always the biggest thing. But have said, you know, if you get the right guy or gal, it's, it's mm. money well spent. Sure. What, um, let's, let's go back to, to the car business here for a second. Dan, um, do you have a, since you're, you're selling 100 cars a month or so, how many cars are you buying? Who's buying the car for you? Well, so we, um, I, before COVID, I had, uh, I had a buyer helping me out that I was grooming to do it. Um, uh, that's something that uh, I think most of you would, would, would agree that as one of the most important functions in the dealership. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, and, and I've always said that I'll, 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 one of the last things I'll give up is signing my own checks. Me too. Um, <laughs> and then, and then, you know, not over at least overseeing the purchase of the acquisition of the inventory. Now at some mm-hmm. point I can't do it all myself, but recently I have been because the, the market has been so volatile that I'm, I have been spending a lot of my time buying cars um, personally. Um, but I had been grooming a buyer, whether he comes back or not after this whole thing, it's hard, it's hard to say. So right now I'm buying every single one of the cars. Mm, wow. So during, during COVID, you know, we've heard a lot of dealers talk about how businesses has, has kind of blown up and you said you kind of had the opposite effect. What do you attribute that to? Is it, is it your region? I mean, what, what's going on? I, I believe y'all have had some rioting issues too. What is that part of it? You know, we haven't had any more writing than than, than any, anywhere else. Um, okay. Through with the with the, with the, the recent stuff, um, we're we're known for a previous one, but that uh, that's that's long gone. Um, you know, what's funny is is we have uh, you know I'm in a 20 group as just like just like most of us, and you know we get on a Zoom call. Chuck Bonanno is uh, our our moderator, and talking to Chuck, he says he can't quite figure it out either, but he he hears the same thing. Our area is a lot less affected by COVID um, mm. as far as the virus is concerned, the infections and everything else. Um, mm. 
he's not really sure either, but he, that's what I'm, and I'm hearing from other sources too, just certain areas hmm. are killing it, having record months, other areas, not so much. And I have a good friend in Kansas city that, um, you know, we have same size dealership, same demographic, you can't get any closer to demographics than St. Louis and Kansas city he is experiencing <laughs> the exact same. We have the exact same numbers. We sell the exact same amount of cars. I mean, it's just, hmm. it's, it's eerie huh. on completely opposite sides of the state. Huh. Um, that's interesting. Very interesting. I, yeah, what well, else I, I, I can't figure it out. Please, please tell me if you can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so much, so much regional attitudes and regional stuff and, and, and people are migrating too. I mean, I know my area is booming from a construction standpoint and a demand and, and consumption standpoint, just because mm. everyone's leaving California and heading to Nevada, Utah and Colorado and Idaho, you know what I'm saying? Everyone wants off the coast. So, so, so yeah, those are super interesting dynamics. What, um, Dan, I guess to, to kind of put a pin in this and wrap up this EO converse, EOS conversation, you kind of talked about how dealers could get started in this. And, and I guess maybe why I want to back up and my overall observation of this is we do have dealers of every size listening, right? And there is a situation where a dealer, again, you're the owner operator, it's you and your wife, or it's you and your son, or it's you on your own. And you're making a great living, probably selling 20 to 30 cars a month. You're there all day, every day, but you, you're not looking to have, 20 employees or 30 employees, right? But on the flip side of that, there are people who want to scale and want to grow a long-term business for themselves or their kids or just the impact they can have in their community. This is the only way to do it, right? So the thing is that you just touched on something a little bit, Jeff, and you talk about this all the time in, in your, in your podcast is that you talk about the, the, you know, the, 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 the very small guy, just a handful of employees or, you know, and, and they talk about this in traction that, we'll never know what the, the, the best company in the world is because it may be some $30 million company in Idaho that no one really knows about, but their profitability is off the chart. Their, 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 their happiness level is off the chart. Um, so it's not necessarily about size. It's, it's, it's about all these components. What do you want for your life and your business? Yes. Um, and put it into a, into a, into a, a direction you know, I didn't really talk too much about the vision part of it, but, it, but, it's, but it's also, you know, it starts off, where do you expect to be in 10 years? What's your long-term yeah. plan, right? Yeah, begin it starts with, with that of, vision. Begin with the end in mind, and then you work your way back. What's your three-year picture and what's your one-year target? So, yep. um, you know, so it, it, it's not, and I've, I've learned a lot about being in the 20 groups as well is, you know, there's guys that'll sell twice as many cars as I do, but are they doing better? Uh, you guys have experienced that. You're sitting next to the guy that appears to be doing killing it and you're like my god how'd you afford to get here once you look at once you look at their yeah. composite yeah <laughs> and that's you know that's so the one thing 20 group has taught me is the vision part of it how to look way far out you know it, we we look at a five-year plan and, and we we go at it um and we back into it but i think so many dealers get caught up in the monthly plan how many cars did i sell this month what did i do this month and that's really just the the, the wrong way to look at it and, and You've got to have this vision. You've got to have a structure to get there. And, and I think this is great. Um, Dan, one last question. And it seems like you read a lot. I, I do as well. I love to. Is there a couple of books you'd recommend for um, other than the ones we talked about that you'd recommend for a dealer out there? I recommend hands down every time with for anybody, dealer or anybody, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, Stephen mm -hmm. Covey, Luke, I'm sure you've read it. I'm guessing. Yeah, that's great. Um, I mean, I, and, I, and I just actually had my, uh, my management team, we read a book a quarter. It's not, a, not a lot to ask. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the, and I had them, them all read that and I've reread it as well. And I, I realized how much I've really modeled my life, um, <laughs> um after this, uh, five dis dysfunctions of a team by, by Patrick Lencioni. That's a really good one as well. Um, you know, but I would start with everything we just talked about. I would start with, well, seven habits because a lot of the same stuff is sure. you know, based on this, but the traction is a really good one to at least see which direction you want to go. Yeah. I'm gonna have to pick that one up. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Very, very interesting. Luke, any other questions for Dan? I mean, I feel like I could go on forever about <laughs> this. This is the kind of stuff that I really excites me because I, I think as, dealers that are in that mid grade well any dealer actually in all areas it really comes down to what dan said is your vision 
and what is your vision and, and then you just got to get there. Do you want to be tied to your business all day, every day? Fine. You love that. Mm -hmm. That's what you really, really enjoy is being on the concrete and being on the sales floor and doing that. Awesome. Do you want to find a better work-life balance? You don't want to be in on Saturdays or get a phone call on Sunday that you have to go sell a car or do a test drive. You know, how are you going to get there? Um, that's really, you know, you know, Luke, that, that excites me. So this is, this yeah. is. Dan, and Dan's really given us a roadmap to get there. Yeah. I it was, I think was, was, was it, it wasn't me. It was the guy that wrote the book. I just, I just pointed, and it wasn't even. I was pointed towards it. Again, there's, there's a lot of people out smarter than me. That I just, I just, I, I, I'm not one that could ever invent the wheel, but I'll steal the heck out of a hubcap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, brother. I'm with you. All right, Dad. Thanks so much. Thank you, right, guys. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Hope this episode inspired you to take positive action. Remember to subscribe so you get each episode the day it comes out. And we would love your help spreading the word. Leave us a review and share this podcast with your dealer friends. Dealers helping dealers learn and grow together.